And that's what a hard drive provides. So here's an example of a modern hard drive. This is a four terabyte drive from Seagate. It costs about $150 to get a four terabyte drive. I'm gonna take a little excursion to look at bandwidth again. So we talked about bandwidth, I think the class before spring break when we talked about networking. What is the bandwidth of a container ship full of these hard drives? Do you think that's gonna be better or worse than your gigabit ethernet in terms of bandwidth? Yeah, right, so that's the key thing. So that the latency is gonna be horrible. Right? We've gotta wait for two weeks to get this across the ocean, but the bandwidth is the data per time. It always has a distance component. We often don't include the distance. So when people talk about gigabit ethernet, gigabit means a billion bits per second. Where's the distance there? Why is there no distance there, but there better be one here? Yeah. How fast is the data traveling? in your gigabit ethernet cable? Yes. Uh, so the question was how, how fast is the data traveling? So this should be a, a so I'm asking in the cable, so we're, we're measuring gigabit ethernet in terms of bits per second, but I've made the claim that bandwidth really should always have a distance component. So the question is, how fast is the data traveling in your ethernet? When someone says gigabits per second is the speed of their ethernet, why do they not have to mention distance? Yes, good, right. So it's traveling at the speed of light, or very close to it. It's traveling in fiber optic cable. Speed of light is fast enough that at least most of the distances that we think about, we can ignore the distance. But there is a distance component, and it's gonna take longer if the distance between the two points is further. Okay, so let's be a little more specific in actually figuring this out. We need some information about shipping containers. So this is actually very well standardized how big a shipping container is. It's, there's 20 foot or 40 foot, and we've got the dimensions of our hard drive. I think that might include the box, but we'll be conservative and assume that we need that amount of space for each one. So we can calculate how many boxes we can fit in one container, and I get 87,000, probably that's about right. I have not tried to fit 87,000 hard drives into a shipping container. We also need to know how many actual bits do we have. Right, so our goal is if we're gonna measure bandwidth, we wanna know bits per time. So this hard drive is four terabytes. How many bits is that? It's a very tricky question. Right, so we said four terabytes, that sounds right. So it's, if we're turning bytes into bits, we're multiplying by eight. It's 32, whatever the T stands for, terabits. Does the T stand for a trillion or something else? We, we said if we're thinking about designing storage systems, we have to think about economics. If we're thinking about what terms mean, that's really a legal question. And there was a lawsuit about this. It turns out that according to this lawsuit, the, the hard drive manufacturers were marketing their drives where T meant a trillion, but what people thought it should mean was the 1,024 times 1,024 times 1,024. There was a lawsuit about this and people got some, what usually happens with lawsuits like that, the lawyers get a bunch of money and people get a coupon that's not really worth anything. But um, I think that's how they decided what a terabyte means. But either of those values is really close, so it doesn't really matter much for this question. We will use this answer and so the number of bits in our shipping container is three times 10 of 18. Is that a lot? It's, close. it's not even a zettabyte though. We need many containers if we're gonna ship a zettabyte in our boat. A zeta is 10 to the 21. If we wanna ship a zettabyte, we need 2,000 shipping containers full of terabyte drives. But that's actually not that hard to get on a ship. Because one of these ships these TEUs are the number of the, the shipping containers that can hold. So one of these ships can hold 18,000 of them. That's about six zeta bytes on our ship. So what's the bandwidth? Do we know everything we need to know to figure out the bandwidth yet? Or do we need some other information? Good, yeah, we need to know the speed that it's traveling at. We actually have that on here thanks to Wikipedia. It's about 20 knots. I don't know what a knot is, but it's about 40 kilometers per hour. So now we can actually figure out what we're getting. So we're gonna take, this is the number of zettabytes we can fit on our ship. So there's 18,000 containers, 
we need 2,000 some containers for each zettabyte, and we're converting that distance into meters per second. Our container ship bandwidth is 0.07 zettabyte meters per second. How does that compare to gigabit ethernet? Other than I think container ships are kind of cool, and it's interesting to think about things this way, the real important part of the story is that latency matters. Part of the reason storage systems are complicated is these cost trade-offs, and the big cost trade-off is between how much it costs to store a bit and how long it takes to get that value. We don't care about how many bits we can store if we can't get to them quickly when we need them. So what is the latency of our hard drive? Now let's assume it's not on a container ship, so we don't have to wait two weeks for it to arrive. It's connected to our physical machine. What is its latency? How do we think it's going to compare to the DRAM latency? Yes. So it's definitely going to be a lot more than the DRAM. And the reason it is is because it's actually a physical thing moving around. It's going to be many orders of magnitude slower than the DRAM. This is the way a hard drive looks. We've got some magnetic medium, usually many disks like this. You can see the one on top, but there's many below it. And they're physically spinning around. And they're spinning around at about 6,000 revolutions per minute. So there's a limit how fast you can spin things without them burning up. And they're designed to get pretty close to those limits. In order to read a bit from a hard drive, what do you have to do? So does it take the same amount of time to read all bits from the hard drive, or is there a variation? OK, good. So it depends on where things are physically. So there are two things that it depends on. Bits are stored across this and all around the circle. So it depends on how far the disk has to spin to get to the head. Here we can see one head. There may be several heads, but there's some small number of heads. And the head can read just one position, or maybe it can read a row at a time, but it can read only one physical area of the disk. So we need to wait for it to spin around, and we need to move this head to the right part. We're moving real physical stuff here. It's small and fast, but anything like that compared to electrons takes a long time. So the two times that matter, time it takes to rotate, can take up to 10 milliseconds. Compared to the time it took to get out of the DRAM, where we were talking order of 10 nanoseconds, here we're talking order of 10 milliseconds. So that's a million times slower. If you're lucky, you don't have to rotate all the way around. So the average time is going to be half that. And if you're lucky, you don't have to go all the way around. If you're smart, this gets back to the same issue that Turing was dealing with programming with memory and delay lines. Will you figure out how to put things on disk and how to read them to try to read things that are going to be near the head? This is what people designing databases that are stored on disk spend a lot of time doing, trying to figure out how to store your data in a way that you don't have to do a lot of seeks and don't have to wait a long time to rotate, that your data is going to be where you want to read it when you get to it. So if you've got physical things like this, and remember that the head is a physical thing that's touching this magnetic thing to read values from it. So if your drive falls on the floor or gets shaken up, while that's near the surface, it's going to make a big scratch and eliminate some of your data. So how do you solve this? Make it so you don't lose data when you drop your computer. And I'm not encouraging you to actually try the drop test now, although I think most of your computers will probably survive it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So what's going on? When you drop your computer, while it's in flight, accelerometer, and these are real cheap. So I assume the ones they can buy bulk and put in disk drive don't cost nearly that much. They're probably costing a few cents, not a few dollars. It recognizes that it's falling, and it gets the head out of the way. Lifts it off the surface, and probably if there's time, actually rotates it to be in a harmless position. Disk drives seem pretty good. Very cheap storage per bit. They're persistent, even if we drop them, as long as the power's on. But once the power's off, the head's also out of the way. So it's safe to drop your computer when the power's off as well. It's kind of like dropping cats. If you drop them from high enough, they're OK. If it's a low drop, it might not survive. Uh, but I don't encourage experiments with either laptops or cats to figure that out. But the time is about 5 milliseconds. How many nanoseconds is that? How does that compare to the, the mercury delay lines that Turing was working with? Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot slower. So milliseconds are really long times. And, and units are sort of confusing things. Milliseconds, there's 1,000 in a second. Nanoseconds, there's a billion. So this is 5 million nanoseconds. So it's much slower than the delay line, but much, much cheaper per bit. 
let's assume those are our storage systems. Uh, we're not using the lay line. But we've got DRAM and a disk drive. The goal of the operating system is to provide a nice abstraction for programs to use to access storage. We're going to start talking about those storage abstractions now.